Nick, 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 non iron shirt i really have a problem with this i need to like work on doing my ironing but it is what it is i'm rocking it for you know people watching our special guest tonight director author more importantly for us growing up creator of are you afraid of the dark dj mikhail how are you doing buddy i'm doing well i'm the co-creator of are you afraid of the dark my partner ned candle right so, yeah mm-hmm. and that's very nice of you to just Give him credit, uh, half and half. I would have taken all of it. (laughs) (laughs) He wanted to call it light. I called it dark. (laughs) There's there's actually a weird thing in this business, and I I don't agree with it, that that the person who gets the created by credit is the person who writes the pilot of any show. Wow, I did not know that. And and, and oftentimes, the person who writes the pilot is the creator, but, 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 uh, and, and Ned is not a writer, Ned, but he's instrumental, certainly on the business end. He's just as responsible for putting Are You Afraid of the Dark together as I am. You know, I'm on the creative end, he's on the business end. So in my mind, he created the show just as much as I did. Yeah. So, uh, so that's why I always will point out that, that he, we co-created the show. The WGA wouldn't agree with that, but... but <laughs> yeah. um, well, that, that's very nice of you. I, you know, it's going to be a great episode. See, if somebody said like, oh, you are you do a show with Brian, Eric, and Ellie, I'd be like, it's my show. They are not any part of it. I'm not as humble as you. I'm just, guy. I'm lying, guys. Well, I have had some circumstances that I will not name names where, where I truly did create the show and someone insisted on getting co-created credit where it's like, mm, you know, no. <laughs> you really yeah. Hard no. Yeah, hard, yeah. Yeah. hard no on that, but... Yeah. All right. So what we want to do before we get into your time in Nickelodeon, uh, just talk about your upbringing, where you're from, how you like got into writing TV shows, being an author just to begin with, man. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut, uh, though I, I consider myself a New Yorker because um, I, I, when I ask people where they're from in Connecticut, and they say like, oh, I'm from somewhere up north. I'm like, oh, that's real Connecticut. I'm from suburban New York. Because I, I grew up in the first town over from New York. So you could see Manhattan from, from the mm. my town. So, so I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I went to NYU. So, you know, I, I'm a New York guy. Uh, and I got into writing because I hated writing. Uh, it was in school. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of odd. But um, when I was a kid, like most kids, I, I didn't want to sit still in a chair. I didn't want to not be running around outside. I didn't want to be watching TV <laughs> or not watching TV. Mm. Um, and so when I was in junior high, a bunch of my buddies and I got together and we came up with this great scam, which is whenever we had to write something, you know, a report or, or an essay, whatever it happened to be on something we didn't care about, we'd make a film or a video about it instead. And, um, and, and we had so much fun making these things. And we made science things and we made dramas, we made comedies, we made all these things not realizing we were working far harder making these movies than we would have just written the stupid paper. Um, but we're having fun. Um, and because back in those days, it wasn't a common thing for kids to do. You know, nowadays on your phone, you can you know, yeah. make a film. Uh, back then, it wasn't like that. Um, so teachers didn't know how to grade these things. So we always got A's. That was an option for you? They like let you pick? You know what I mean? Or well, no, well, no, it, well, yeah, I guess it was, but it wasn't common. So we, the, the first time we did it, it was in a biology class and we had to do a report on this really exciting topic called about algae. Mm. You, you know, you exactly. <laughs> Wait, what kind though? Some is exciting. I will say. Or a fill. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we went to this, I don't know. Oh, and there was a guy at my school who was like the media specialist and he got this black and white reel to reel crappy piece of machinery in. And he said, do you guys want to use this? And we were like, no, <laughs> but then we got this idea. I went to that biology teacher and said, instead of writing a report about algae, can we make a videotape about it instead? And no one had ever asked that question before. She was like, I guess. So we're like, okay, great, fine. Yeah. Right. So it really wasn't that common, but we did it all the way through junior high and high school, um, thinking we were getting out of writing. And um, I, I, for, when I got out of high school, I first went to Villanova University and, and realized 
I didn't know what I was doing there. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living or whatnot. And a friend of mine said, you know, you love making movies in high school. Why don't you go to film school? Like, bing. So that's when I transferred to NYU. And, uh, and, and when I went to NYU, um, whatever, whatever major is, you have to take all the courses that go along with that major. And when you're a film guy, you have to take acting and directing and lighting and all that kind of stuff. You have to take writing. And I hate to write. So I went to this teacher and I was like, uh, this is going to be ugly because I hate to write. And she laughed at me and she said, DJ, you like telling stories, right? And, yeah. and, she was like, and, you, and you like telling the story to you. And then based on the feedback you get back on your story, you change the story to make it funnier, or scarier, or whatever. Yeah. She goes, doofus, what, what, what do you think writing is? <laughs> and I was like, oh. I'm so happy that worked out for you in high school. I tried to do the same thing, but I would make collages and teachers weren't having it because I was just <laughs> cutting and pasting things at 17 years old. <laughs> they were like, yeah, no, you have to work. write a paper. <laughs> put in the work. Believe me, we put in the work. Yeah. So, so that, that got me into making movies and, and writing movies. And, and when I got out of college, I was like, okay, I'm writer man. Now what do I do? And, and I didn't know what to write. I, so I started writing all the stuff I thought I should be writing, which is all the wrong stuff. I, I was writing deeply dramatic plays and feature films about people in times of stress. And I was getting nothing but no, no, uh, no, no. And, and it's because I didn't know the secret. And the, and the secret is that if you want to be creative, whatever the thing you want to do that's creative, making collages, for example. Oh, yeah. If, if you want to do something that's creative, you don't necessarily have the choice of what you can do. It says you have to find out what's in here before you can decide what comes out. And I always love telling the story, and I hope it's true because it's a good story. Um, someone once asked Stephen King why he writes horror stories. And he said, I don't know, that's what comes out. Mm. You know, Stephen King's not going to write a romantic comedy. It's not going to happen. So it, it, all the stuff that I was writing was the wrong stuff until a friend of mine said, did you ever think about writing for kids? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, I'm like Dr. Seuss. I'm not gonna write for kids. No. But then as soon as I clicked my brain that way, suddenly all these ideas started coming out. And that's what got me into writing for kids. People started saying yes. And that's what got me into the kids entertainment industry. And, and a lot of it was based in New York at the time, which is where I was at the time. And so that's kind of how I gravitated towards writing kids TV shows. And when so you when you were writing your initial plays and you didn't necessarily like find your rhythm or whatnot, was there a certain play or movie you kept trying to like emulate that, like you, you were a big fan of like, Oh, I want to write something like, I don't know, Scorsese or something. It just wasn't working for you. Was there a particular um, director or something? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, what, what are the things talk about? You have to write what comes out. You can't necessarily choose what comes out. What I write isn't necessarily what I like to read okay, or, or watch. So for example, I love comedies. I love to laugh. I am not a funny guy. Okay. <laughs> or, I'm, or I'm not a funny writer anyway. So one of the things I did is uh, kind of a rule of thumb is if you want to try to get a job writing TV, what you do is pick one of your favorite shows that you really like and write an episode of that show as a sample to show what you can do. So uh, I wrote an episode of MASH. Mm. You know, oh, pick the best written show on television yeah. to try to write that. Yeah. Um, and I just got no, and that was in, that was one of my, Oh, you, you have to find out what you're good at and what comes out. Um, and, and it was trial and error. And I was a big Woody Allen fan. And, and I just, I didn't, I, it, I can appreciate it, but I can't necessarily churn it out. Right. I found out that I'm much more adept at writing creative adventure, scary drama, melodrama kind of stuff that's what comes out i don't necessarily like to watch it but, right. but, but that's what i write so that but must... yeah you couldn't concoct any hole on a piece of paper just no, wasn't I, for you in fact i just it's when you asked me that question i flipped through what the thing and there was an article written about me back in college because i got some award and one of the th i just saw it not that long ago, it, was, it was back in the days when you like cut out the newspaper clipping and... collages collages yeah <laughs> collage <Like> collage guy. <laughs> 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 stick in it. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, who's this thing? And I read it. Oh, well, the reason I read it is because I found this film I made in college and I just got it digitized so I could see it. Ooh. Bad. Yeah. Can we see it? Uh, yeah, you want to see it? I could actually, actually, I don't have it here. Um, it's okay. We know where you live now. But I saw yeah. <laughs> It's actually not hard. There are a couple of moments where I'm like, oh, that was pretty good. But, but in general, 
it's a student film. Um, but in this article, it said that my favorite movie, one of my favorite directors was Woody Allen. Mm. And I look back at it now, I'm like, well, besides Woody Allen being persona non grata, it's right. just like, yeah, like I'm going to strive to achieve that kind of comedy. That's not going to happen. So, right. But I did find out what came out, thank God, or I, or I would have been doing something else the rest of my life, no. figuring out computer speakers or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you figured it out, though, man. Uh, Brian, you got anything? I got to tell you, when it comes to Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> I would put some of the the characters that were in that show, specifically Nosferatu, as one of the top iterations of Dracula that's ever been created. The scariest. Yeah. Well, you know, something funny fun about that is that there's an article. I'm, I'm a big horror fan. Uh, so I shouldn't say horror fan. I'm a spooky fan. Uh, I, I don't like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Gore. But I do like horror. I do like spooky. I like supernatural. And, uh, and I always watched them growing up. And there was this magazine that I used to love to read when I was a kid. It was called Famous Monsters of Filmland. I think they still make it now. I think it's changed hands. Um, but it's like, you know, the pinnacle of some people's careers, they get an Oscar or something like that. I had an article about Are You Afraid of the Dark in Famous Monsters of Filmland. That was like, yeah. And one of the things they wrote about was that Nosferatu episode. Oh. And what they said in in the article is something I did not know. And that was that makeup, that makeup design was used exactly three times. One was in the original Nosferatu, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Are You Afraid of the Dark? And the other one was in the, the TV miniseries, remember Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Mm -hmm. where the vampire and Count Orlock, whatever his name, was, had that Nosferatu makeup. So that was, I thought, wow, I'm, I'm in good company here. That's, that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. So, so I'm glad. Yeah, I, 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 as far as Chris, the guy, Chris, who played uh, Nosferatu, I've seen him play a vampire in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. He was a vampire <laughs> in Twilight. He was a vampire oh. in True Blood. It's like, you need a vampire? Oh, the right. role he was born in. got a guy. Play. Yeah. <laughs> you got a guy. The, the piggyback um, on, sorry, or just a piggyback on scary freaking monsters. That motherfucker, sorry for my legs. Like that dude who came out of the wall, the Quicksilver guy. Oh my God. Do you remember that? He came out of the wall and that girl was like starting the fire and she was like, I did it all wrong in the dream and she didn't have the right silver because a spoon wasn't made of silver. That guy was scary as fuck too. Like you guys just were so good at scaring the shit out of us. It yeah. was amazing. For kid, yeah, for kids yeah. especially. I remember like when certain episodes would come on, it's like the Nosferatu and I watched it one time. I couldn't sleep right for a week. And then every time it would come on rerun, I'd be like, oh, change the channel. I can't watch this one. Yeah. I just yeah. got it out of my head. Yeah, and that clown, that clown yes. was terrifying. Yes. Which was Zebo? Yes. That was the first episode, was it? Was that one of the first, Zebo? Yeah, it was in the first season. Yeah. yeah. It was a, a funny thing about that was uh, we uh, you know, we had just started making the show, the series. We made the pilot about six months before, and then we're making the series. And we hadn't shot anything yet. And we're lining up all the first episodes and laughing in the dark. Zebo episode is one of the first ones we shot. And and I was sitting in the, the wardrobe room with uh, Bill Bonecutter, one of our producers. That's so and awesome. we had Wait, his name his name was Bill Bonecutter. Why wasn't he Isn't a that surgeon? One of the greatest names you ever heard. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh my God. It, it would name for a surgeon. Yeah, it wouldn't be good if it was William, but Bill works. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's actually yeah. it was a uh, uh, interpretation of German, which is actually Knacken Schneider. <laughs> so oh. that didn't. Oh. <laughs> you know Schneider. Yeah. which apparently means bone cutter in German. I don't know. That's so cool. And I don't know if that was surgeon or butcher. Um, yeah, we don't want to know. No. Not, maybe both. I, yeah. I don't know. Um, but we're we're uh, we're sitting in the wardrobe room, and we had the big Zebo dummy in there, the thing that comes out of the, mm -hmm. the the door in the fun house. And and we're sitting there, we're looking at this thing. We hadn't even shot the episode yet. And Bill says, "God, I'll never forget this." He said, "You ever get the feeling that?" 20 years from now, somebody's going to come up to you and say, excuse me, are you DJ McHale? And you'll say, yeah. And he'll say, I'm Zebo the Clown. <laughs> you warped me for life. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> really? <That> my <laughs> <laughs> years later, I was on a book tour, because I'm also an author. I was on a book tour in Indianapolis, I think it was. And we're at a Bennigan's of all places. 
Wow. And, uh, and, and this, mm. I, I even around anymore. And this, and this, you know, happy waiter. Goes, Hi, I'm John. I'll be your waiter tonight. I said, Hi, John. And he goes, What are you doing in town? I guess we didn't look we were, like we're from Indianapolis. And I said, Well, we're here for a book convention. Oh, what do you write? And I didn't think he'd know anything that I wrote. So I said, Well, I used to write a TV show called Are You Afraid of the Dark? And he goes, oh, Zebo the Clown. And I was like, Oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> <Bill was right. laughs> <laughs> I'm just with a knife on the table. This guy's good as you, but, but he wasn't. He, he was happy. The um, uh, Eric, did you have a question, or you asked? Uh, I was gonna. Part? It was from a while ago, but we interview a lot of musicians, and they say it's it's kind of frustrating because they feel pressured to kind of stay in their lane. If they rap about like hardcore rap, they're pressured to stay there. If they want to sing, they're pressured to stay there. Do writers feel like that as well? Like you said, you like to write spooky things, like. And you're not comfortable writing comedy like comedy and things like that. Do do writers come across that as well? One hundred percent. Yeah, um, especially in TV and movies, mm -hmm. where I mean, it's not just writers, it's directors, it's actors, it's anyone who does something creative. That mm -hmm. if someone is going to take a chance on you, meaning pay you money and, mm -hmm. and want you to make something, they're going to want the confidence that you can deliver. And the mm -hmm. best way to get that confidence is that you've delivered that before. So yeah. if you want a movie about red roses and you say, well, you know, I made this movie about white roses. Like, well, no, sorry, we're looking for a red yeah. rose. Yeah. Um, so, so I have had where my easiest lane for getting other projects underway are always sort of in this, not always spooky, but, but mm -hmm. in this kind of vein. If I came out with a romantic comedy, people would be like, hmm. It would take a big leap, even if it was great, it would take a big leap for someone to say yes, because mm -hmm. just because the script is good doesn't mean the show or the movie is going to be good. And if it fails, it's their fault. So they're like, what'd you take a script from this guy from? He doesn't know what yeah. 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 So yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. When, you, any, when, you're, uh, when you're coming up with concepts for episodes and things like that, obviously you have to turn it into the network and they have to okay things. Did you, did you find that... A, was there a lot of stuff that you had written that may have gotten taken out? And then you were like, oh, you can't take this. You can't take that. The short answer, Brian, is no. It, huh? was, it was amazing. And, and this is a larger answer than just Are You Afraid of the Dark? But talk to anyone who made shows for Nickelodeon back in those days, and they'll give you the same answer. Yeah. Which is it was a great place to be making shows because they just let you make what you wanted to make. Wow. As long as people watched it and they liked it. I mean, if it sucked, you wouldn't be making it anymore. Yeah. But, but all the crazy, there was a movie that was made recently called The Orange Years. It was all about that. That's, uh, that's, that's kind of where I got the idea to contact all you guys. Yeah, it, it, uh, everyone has it. the same answer that I had. It's just like, oh my God, you, you, you could do whatever you want. So it, specifically with scripts, I did whatever I wanted to do. It so was cool. unbelievable. That's no question anything I, it also helped that we shot the show in montreal because it was kind of like we we're we we're away from everyone we we're off on the we we're in another freaking country Be, they're like okay have fun storming the castle you know go ahead make your show and as long as we delivered everything was cool so we just we worked in a vacuum and just made the shows it wasn't until somewhere around the second season that i even had a sense that people were even watching the show Back, back in those days, there you didn't have social media. Yeah, I, yeah. I was one of those people who looked at ratings. I didn't care. It was just like they kept ordering, and I kept. TV making... Guide came in a book back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was boy talk about uh, famous monsters of film. Man, I have a thing on my office at home. It was a TV Guide top ten kids shows of the year, and Are You Afraid of Doc was number one. That was like that it, was it, a... you could argue cool. it's one of the best of all time. Honestly, oh, yeah, uh, Ellie, if, I know you're you're the youngest out of us, so I know you were a little younger watching the show, getting a little spooked. Uh, I know you mentioned your brother would scare the shit out of you out of the room. So uh, yeah. yeah, so I wanted to say thank you for that because when I was I was about three when I like was finally like, cognizant of like Are You Afraid of Doc and really got into Nickelodeon and whatnot. Um, and I have an older brother, obviously. And so whenever I'd like be annoying or want to watch TV with him, he would switch on to Are You Afraid of the Dark? Cause you know, I would hightail it out of there and be like, nope, I'm out. I would try to watch it, but I'm not scared. I'm not scared. And then, you know, it, if something would come out or like, nah, and I'd be like, no, I'm going to die. And, you know, so I'm pretty sure that's why I'm an adult now and even married, but I'm still afraid of the dark. So thank you. I'm pretty sure that's where that fear comes from. So yes, I am afraid of the dark to answer the question. Yes. Um, so thank you for that. And then I wanted to know, 
did you ever draw like any inspiration from Freddy Krueger? I've never seen any of those movies. Really? Really? But um, you're a I mean, I know what they are. I know what they are. Right. I've seen scenes. Those are slashers. But, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. But I mean, I think like it's, it's, it's pretty creative because there's kids' dreams that came to life. So, yeah. Right. I, I, oh, but I, can I tell you a funny story about that too? Yes. But, yes. Um, I made a movie for Disney uh, called Tower of Terror. And it was, uh, it was have you seen it? <laughs> or you've been on the ride? Both love the ride and the movie. <laughs> I, I made that movie. Everyone directed that movie. And um, uh, we hired a guy to write the score for that movie. And, and, and back, you know, when you're not doing huge budgets, it's not like you're John Williams that is a giant orchestra, you know. Mm. It's, it's a guy sitting at his keyboard, but, but the technology is so great that it sounds like a big orchestra. And so this guy um, it, it composed, composed and, and performed the score for, for the movie. And it was fabulous. It was really good. I like hooks. I like musical hooks. If you go through the Are Afraid of the Dark episode, one of the things that episodes, I think one of the things that really makes Are Afraid of the Dark stand out is that each episode was scored individually like a separate movie. Hmm. Each, aside from the opening and closing theme song, each tale had its own unique score style, and, and hook. I, so I really like hooks. And, and this composer for Tower of Terror came up with some really good hooks for Tower of Terror. And he was almost come finished with the score. It was almost done. And I had heard every cut that he did. I liked him all, it was great, oh my God. And one day I went to, to watch, uh, hear one of the playbacks from one of the new cuts he had done. And I happened to bring the editor and the assistant editor with me who had been locked in a cave for a long time. And they, I let them come out for once. And they went to his house and listened to the score. And while we're listening to this thing, and I'm loving it, I think it's great. And I hear the editor and the assistant editor behind me like, Like, shut up, shut up. And they're like, good, this is going back and forth. Finally, finally they left the room. Like, What's going on? So I went to the other room and the editor is looking at the assistant editor and he says, you got to tell him. And the assistant editor is like, no, nah, I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> and he's like, you got to tell him. Tell him. Tell me what? And he said, one of those hooks, like the main hook that he wrote for, for, for the movie, it's the theme from Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, wow. No way. And I was like, no, I had not seen these movies. I couldn't say one. But this guy was, was younger. He had seen all the Nightmare on Elm Street. And I was like, okay, let's not say anything. So we went out and we got the score from Nightmare on Elm Street. The, the main hook was, da, 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 da. That was, it was four, da, 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 da. And I played it through all. Sure enough, that was the hook from Tower of Terror. I'm like, oh, my God. This thing's almost done. Ah, right. I have to tell Disney. Oh, my God. We have to redo this whole right. thing. So I went right. to Disney and I said, ah, you know, funny thing. <laughs> and, and I told them what happened. And they're like, you got to change it. And I was like, hey, it's only four notes. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, four notes. Da, 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 da. Four notes are a lot of Yeah. Them. Yeah. Like, You're a good really example. Good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We get sued over. They were sued for some drum rhythm that was in The Lion King. It says, you got to change this. Right. <sighs> I went back to the composer and I was like, uh, you got a problem. And I told him what's going on. And this guy panics. He's like, oh my God, oh. he's thinking about his career. He's thinking about, right. they're going to hate me. That I had done this whole score. What am I going to do? Right. I'm like, Let's not panic. Let's think about this thing. Remember, this thing is all digital at this point. So the, so the cue was, da, 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 da. What if we change it to, da, 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 da. And he goes, that, that, that could work. That could work. So he goes, dit, 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 dit. search and replace. The entire score is redone in like five seconds. And the no. movie was done with a different score. It's no longer Nightmare on Elm Street. And I composed that for it. Wow. <laughs> Look at you. Okay, well, you can add that to the resume. Composer yeah. as well as director and writer. But that's the closest so, I got to Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> and it, that's long pretty after cool. Yeah. So I had a question to follow up to that. So do you not like kids? Is that what part of like your inspiration for writing a scary show to make kids like piss their pants constantly and to like, you know, their older have their older brothers torture them and make them leave, make them leave the room? Like, I mean, that's a genuine question. Do you hate children? They just wouldn't get off your lawn. I have a kid. My kid just graduated high school. She's going to college. No, it's, yeah, I like kids. I love kids. That's why I like writing for kids. I remember what it's like to be a kid. So I can kind of get into that mindset to write for kids. Um, but the reason I do write this stuff, A, that's what comes out. <laughs> it's what I like and that's what 
Um, but I'll also tell you, and people don't like to hear this who are big fans of Are You From The Dark, but usually they go, oh yeah, that's true. It, I have to admit that you know, it's really fun talking about the show, as you can tell. I'm, I have fun talking about Are You From The Dark. Sure, uh, sure. I thought that 30 years later, I'd be talking about Are You From The Dark, believe me. Um, <laughs> in spite of what Bill Bonecutter said. Um, so it's really fun to hear people talk about it. And, and I, I'm a member of a couple of groups and I comment on stuff that they, they do. But, but it kind of, I have one little lament that it seems like one criteria that so many people have when they rate the episodes, you know, this is a great episode, this is not a great episode, was that they think the scarier their episode was, the better it was. Mm. And, That's and not I, a thing. How well, I have to say that? that my goal was not to scare kids in spite of the title. My school, that, that wasn't the goal. My goal was to make a show like Twilight Zone. And, yeah, and Twilight right. Zone isn't necessarily scary all the time. It's no, it makes you think, though. Like, mm -hmm. it makes you ask questions, and it op leaves you those open-ended cliffhangers. You know, it makes you yeah. really think and ponder. So, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. So maybe people also don't like to think, so that could probably be part of it, too. People don't want just stuff, like, spoon-fed to them. So maybe it was a little too high-level thinking for some, and that's why they were like, mm, I don't like this episode. Well, it also comes back to what's memorable. And, and one of the things, you'll laugh at this, but one of the things that I, my own personal mandate and it's one of the reasons why Nickelodeon never had to worry about my scripts because I, I, I did a lot of shows on cable. And back in those days, cable really had no standards and practices. So it was up to us to kind of monitor ourselves and not warp children. Um, I made a show called, or I wrote a show called Encyclopedia Brown for my partner, Ned. And uh, no one was telling us what to do. And I'm like, can we do this? And he's like, we can do whatever we want. So we were self-editing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things going into Are You Afraid of the Dark I remember being a kid, and, and, and Brian, you talked about Nosferatu. What, what, I remember watching a movie when I was a little kid, and, and there was this horrible image of this evil medium woman, and that, that image stayed with me for years. I would have nightmares about that image. I had nightmares about Vampira from Plan 9 from Outer Space, where you see Vampire coming to the camera. I would have nightmares about that. And one of the things going to Are You Afraid of the Dark was I said, I don't want to make a show that would show any image, forget the story, any image that will stick with a kid and freak them out well, you that, did. Last, that lasted about two episodes <laughs> you did. So, Listen, multiple images, I still, actually. to this day i still run upstairs when it's dark behind me because i think something's going to <laughs> yeah it, so so i, I remember that by i'm not going for that solely yeah if it happens every once in a while, Ghastly Grinner, then sure. We, we, oh, we mean I once wanna, in a while, more like hold, every episode, but okay, sure. You, you know what the thing was? I feel like with the show, it was more, rather than like a physical horror, like, like obviously on Nickelodeon, you can't do stabbing and killing and stuff like that. But like, it was very psychological. Like a lot of the jumps, the thinking, the, oh, is this going to be here? Is that going to be there? And I think it just, in my opinion, that type of horror writing sticks more yeah. than the, just the killing. Oh, it was a ghost and it just killed everybody. Oh, okay. It's like, oh, it's a ghost. We have no idea where it comes from. It comes out at specific times. It gets certain people. It just takes you. We don't know where it takes you. It's the, it's the questions more than the, the physical action, you know? Well, there, and there's, and there's another layer to that as well um, where, well, let me go back to specifically what you said, and that is because you can't do horrible stabbings on Nickelodeon. It's like, well, how do you get scary? It's like, well, what's scary, what's truly scary is not what you see, it's what you think you might see. Yeah, the that, imagination. The imagination. And, and so when people used to ask me, you'd say, what's the proper, or, or what's the reasonable age for a kid to watch Are You Afraid of the Dark? And I was like, it has nothing to do with age. It has to do with imagination. Yeah, I had seven-year-olds that were like, yeah, I can't it. or an adults who have an imagination are like, oh my god, what's going to happen? I can't believe it. Mm. So that's so so we played a lot. It's Hitchcock one hundred and one. It's it's what might be yeah. behind the door, and there's never anything hard, rarely thing anything horrible behind the door, but it's always what you might see. But that other layer was every season. I didn't write all the stories. I rewrote all the stories because I'm the showrunner. But but. Uh, I couldn't come up with them all. So I had a lot of, the true Midnight Society are the writers, the, the many writers that wrote that show. And every year I put out a call to, for people to pitch me story ideas. And um, inevitably, 
a pitch would go something like I talk to someone on the phone or in person and, they, and I'd say, what's your idea? And they'd say, um, I have a story about a haunted mouse. I'm like, oh, okay, who are the kids? I'm like, I don't know, a couple of kids. Anyway, haunted <laughs> mouse. Whenever you use this mouse, it will take you to a website that if they had website in those days, it would take you to a website <laughs> that will scare you, whatever. I'm like, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Who are the kids? And they'd be like, who cares? Like, no, 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 no. I want a story about a couple of kids who I'm, or a kid that is going through something real life, some dilemma, some conflict, some, some, some challenge that kids can relate to as no matter how serious or trivial it may be, but kids can relate to it. And they're going through this thing that I'd be interested in finding out how that works out, even if they never came across a haunted mouse, because then once they come across the haunted mouse, then you're with them. So all, hopefully, mostly all the stories of Are Afraid of the Dark are about a couple of kids who you're interested in their characters and what they're doing. Then you infuse this spooky thing and somehow whatever their dilemma is, is somehow solved because of the spooky thing they come in contact with. So, so the episodes are deceivingly complex. And I think that's something that, that has stuck with people and why it's lost it for so, lasts for so long and stuck with people because there's more resonance to the stories than just, hey, Boogeyman's coming out. And, yeah, and, 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 yeah it, it's clever writing too. Like you mentioned the Twilight Zone, like the monsters are doing Maple Street to this day. Like that was written 60 years ago and it still holds true today with technology. It's amazing how ahead of its time some of those episodes were. But like you guys are complex too. Like I always remember the one episode with the girl who is deaf. And she couldn't hear the loud noises. And like you're saying, she was going through getting bullied because of it. And she ends up being the, the, the heroine at the end of the story. So it wasn't just like jump out and spooky stuff. One more thing. I always still say I'm cold like that little boy in the episode. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no the I'm cold. Nothing's I'm... creepier than two words. <laughs> yeah, I'm cold. <laughs> I'm cold. That is creepy. And I still say Sardo, the guy who ran the Sardo shop, the, the magic shop. Also, Brian and I, you'll be happy to know, we have a rap song coming out soon. Actually, we named it the Ghastly Grinner. That's a true Oh, story. that's great. Yeah. So, so, um, super <laughs> so um, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we have your permission to do that. Sue so, him. Um, if I had permission to give, I'd give it to you, but sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a no. Oh, boy. Definitely get sued. Me, there is, oh, I would not, unless you're going to sell it. Well, even then, you know, there, right. there's so much. Just change it to the gassy grinner. <laughs> 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 that would be pretty fun. There is so much, I mean, not just Are You Afraid of the Dark, but there's so much pirated right. material out there. That's for, I'm amazed that I see people with Are You Afraid of the Dark t-shirts. I'm like, you know, that's not licensed. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, right. Viacom's not going to come after you for that. Disney might. <laughs> hey, you know what? If Disney really gets wind of what you're doing, then you got a good problem on hand. That's how I look yeah, at it. Exactly. Well, I don't know. I don't think the bar is that high for Disney to come after you. That's the problem. Oh, it's <laughs> not. Or it's it's not. not. Uh, yeah, you don't want to mess with it. But Disney. I like the way you guys ran the episodes too, because it always didn't end happy. Like, like there was so like the twist at the end was always like freaking. Sometimes it was scary because the kid never ended up always being the hero like the foot the photograph episode with the camera at the end you saw a flash a final thing it wasn't always a happy ending and like was that a thing you guys focused on we can't have every situation end good we need sometimes it's like a scary uh cliffhanger um you know it usually came as a organically from the story and it's also part of the short story tradition which i grew up with and i love reading short stories that they always have that kind of twist at the end but the, the one thing we did focus on was the stories always had a happy conclusion, like a victory conclusion. Mm -hmm. So you get that feeling of, ah, did it. But then you have a little twist at the end. So you get that cathartic, hey, they beat the boogeyman or they solved the mystery, they did whatever. Oh, no, they didn't. So, so we always had to have, it had to be a TV show. It had to be a satisfying beginning, middle and end. Um, but then I often wanted to put a, a little twist on the end that just made you think about it, which is very Twilight Zone too. So yeah, like I, mean, the, 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 I don't think Twilight Zone ever had a happy ending. Um, no. It was very rare. Even like the Jack Klugman episode with the pool <laughs> player at the end, he won yeah. and he ended up having to play pool. Uh, you have you have the two serve man. I mean, there was never a happy ending. I, I'm trying I to think. 
I can think of one. I can think of one, and and I'm not believe I'm not a Twilight Zone expert. I could mm-hmm. I, I think I know it better than I do. But it was this Christmas episode with Art Carney. Art Carney, yeah, uh, yeah. That's the only one where he played Santa in hand. That, that was like one of the first episodes too. That was like one of the first episodes. Yeah. I just saw it not that not that far long ago, and it was it's it's a heartwarming, it's a sad, melancholy story that's happy. And it's like oh my god, this guy. This, forget Tim Allen. This guy gets to be Santa Claus. Yeah, and then Rod, Rod Serling was like, "Enough of this shit. Let's, let's make it's Christmas. Things. Come on, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> let's make things completely creepy." Um, I, Hold on, I got I got yeah, two go on, questions. Man. Yeah. Um. Well, the first one is: Were you part of the decisions for casting the kids that were in the Midnight Society? And two. Is it true that Ryan Gosling turned it down to be part of the Mickey Mouse Club? He was in an episode. He was. Uh, yes and yes. Um, there's only, I can think of one actor that I did not cast. And that was only because given the time, I was on vacation in Italy at the time and I couldn't be reached. Mm-hmm. And it was um, Joanna Garcia played Samantha in the kind of, she came on in season three maybe. And uh Ned and this other guy, Paul, who was the, he, they're like, trust me, you're going to love her. She's going to be great. I'm like, you sure? I'm like, yeah, she's going to be great. And, and she was. Um, but everyone else I, I picked. Um, with Ryan Gosling, when, when we, uh, interestingly, enough, I'll give you a little trivia. The, uh, the episode you mentioned, the, the blind girl, uh, the deaf girl. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the girl played the deaf girl actually played Kiki in the original pilot episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Was, um, was that the one with the trivia the whole like the i don't remember the pilot what was the first episode the pilot was the tale of the twisted claw oh okay yeah and but and, and that then became episode four or something like that but but when we first shot it we had a different midnight society because we shot it several months before we shot the series so um and we did it on the cheap it was like you know we had a bush it was it was really it was it was bad um but I recast almost the entire Midnight Society once we went to series. And I don't remember why, but I kept one actor. Uh, the guy who played Gary actually played in, in five seasons, actually played David in the, that original pilot. I'd love to see that footage. Just I don't even know where it was, but she played King. Um, there was a point to this and I forgot what it was. Um, oh, Ryan Gosling. So back when we went to series, we started fresh and we said, let's recast everybody. And I wanted uh, Ryan Gosling. And we offered him the job, but he had taken the Mickey Mouse Club. So, you know, the Mickey Mouse Club with Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. And, you know, so it's like, it was a questionable decision. I have to Very say. Very questionable. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how that worked out for him, but. Uh, <laughs> Not well. But Not yeah. Well. Has anyone heard of him since? But he. Uh, what a group of losers. <laughs> yeah, <I don't, laughs> poor choice. Um, but they only shot a couple seasons of that show. Um, in Florida, I guess. And he, he lived in Montreal and he came back to Montreal. So and we're still shooting our show. <laughs> and so yeah. it's like, hey, that kid's back. Let's, uh, let's get him. So we got him in an episode of, of the show. So uh, that was another creepy episode where he pretended to be dead. Yeah. Like he, he liked death and then he got called in. I think Gilbert, was Gilbert Gottfried in that? Yeah. yeah. That was a Gilbert <laughs> Gottfried episode. That was he had great. a lot of, yeah, some pretty good uh, ad libs in that one too. The it, It's great when you got an actor that, can ad lib and, and actually elevate the material and and Gilbert, uh, you know, it was it was basically plays a DMV worker <laughs> essentially, yeah. he's leading people to the afterlife. And uh, I wrote a line that said, because uh, the kid's trying to say that they made a mistake, I'm not dead, I shouldn't be here. And he's like, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, yeah. And he added the line, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, what am I going to do? Buy gum? <laughs> I'm dead. What am I going to do? <laughs> I was like, I, I, that was an ad lib on his part. I know you get asked this a lot, and I hate to ask this typical questions, but like, what was your favorite episode? Uh, that's that's an easy one. Um, okay. And and it, it, whenever you ask someone who created a show, mm-hmm. well, you know what their favorite one is. A, they're usually not going to tell you, um, or they're not going to tell you what their least favorite was, because <clears throat> there are plenty. Trust me, um, <clears throat> but. You have to take what they say with a grain of salt because usually their criteria for what's good is not necessarily what someone who's really objectives criteria is. Like I hear people writing about how their favorite episodes were and I'm like, really? Yeah. 
Yeah. That yeah. one? Like, we go, sure we, that we go one? through it. We go through it with some of the episodes we do, and we like leave, and we're like, that wasn't good. And people are like, that was a great episode. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. Like, it's, and it, and it, it is really is all subjective. If it's yeah. great, for you, then it's, it's great. I, I don't get that. But um, so the reason for, I definitely have my favorite episode by far. And, and it's not just because I think it's a really good episode. I think it is. Is it the best episode? I don't know. But, but it's, it's really good. I'll be the judge of this. You, you can be the judge of this. <laughs> I'm fairly certain you'll agree. Um, uh, but, the, but the other reason that it's my favorite episode is that when, we sh we sh when you do a show, the first season, you're just trying to figure out how to do it, especially when it's a hard show like that. And, and everything's by the seat of his pants, and we weren't sure if it was going to work, but it did, thank God. And then we came into the second season and suddenly things got a lot easier. And so we were able to elevate what we could do. And this episode, to me, felt like the best illustration of what we were capable of. It's like the first time we were hitting on all cylinders. I'm like, wow, this is really good. And it was the Nosferatu episode. All right. It, uh, it was the Midnight Madness. Um, I, I thought that was the first time that it was like, whew, okay. We got this. We can do this. So that, that's why it's my favorite episode. So I, I think the creepiest part about that, and Brian touched on the makeup, not the makeup, just the silence that person moved with. Like, it was just like a, like he would turn to the other people. Like, it was just fucking crazy. <laughs> Should have won an Oscar. Well, he was Nasratu. He was in the silent. <laughs> I know, but it was just perfect. I would have been horrible. I would have been smiling at the kids. <laughs> like, hey, come play with me. I, I, have a, I don't know if I could do a screen share. Actually, I'm not even sure if I have it. I have a picture, and I'll describe it to you. It was, a, it was a, taken on the set. So I directed that episode. And uh, it, was a, it was a scene that was shot, if you remember the episode, it was shot in the movie, in yeah. the movie, in the movie. So it was in the crypt that... that it became a black and white movie. And, and I was standing there with Chris, who was the vampire and uh, the other guy who was the vampire's victim in the beginning. And, and he was dressed in like some Edwardian clothing with long hair and cause he was part of that movie. And, uh, and I remember standing there waiting for the shot to be set up. And I looked at Chris and I was like, hmm, I wonder what happens when you bite the neck of a vampire. So, so I remember, and I bit Chris's neck and someone took a picture of that. And I have a picture of that. And, <laughs> and, and Chris is just like, ooh. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have it on this computer. I should probably show it to you. But um, the funny thing about it, and it won't be funny because you have to see the picture. I think it's funny. But I show that picture at school all the times. And that guy who played the other guy, the victim, who kind of long hair, is kind of pasty face. This one kid <laughs> wipes his hand back and goes, is that Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> That's I was like, no, that whoa, he kind of looks like Michael Jackson. I'm yeah, sorry to like, tell people that Michael Jackson was in Are You Afraid of the Dark? It's not like he can deny it. <laughs> yeah, right? there's no way he can deny it. Yeah. Um, okay, DJ, this is really fun. We do a final segment, but we'll do no. one last round table going, Ellie. Okay, so I'm sure you're aware of how much, and even when people aren't even aware of, even subconsciously, how much in music can influence your mood and perception and whatnot. So, how integral was that for you? I mean, it sounds, I mean, Sounds like it was obviously important since each episode had its own score, essentially, um, or not essentially, it did. So was that a big component of it for you? Was that, did you have a lot of like emphasis on that? Or were you, how involved were you with that? And how important was that to you? And, you know, making sure that the right, it was, you know, had the right, evoking the right emotions at the right time. Um, yeah, elaborate on that. Point. I don't want to go so far as to say it was everything, but it was pretty close to everything. Mm -hmm. um, the, there were two guys who were, like I described with the Tower of Terror movie, there are two guys who were the composers and performers of all those scores. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Fisher and Ramon Fabi, both incredibly talented composers and performers. And what I would do with every episode, I would sit and I'd watch the episode and I'd get in my head what the style of it I wanted it to be, what the feel I wanted it to be. But I can only use words. I'm not a musician. Right. Um, and then I'd go through the entire episode and I'd... Um, I I'd, I'd, uh, uh, I'd, I'd put where I wanted each, each cut to begin and end. Uh, so this is what we need here. That's what we need there. Because with scary, I mean, music is so important to any movie, comedy, hey, whatever it is. And the best works subliminally on you. You don't know. Yes. Really on you. Right. Yeah. The subconscious ones where it's like they're evoking this emotion. Like, oh, I'm kind of starting to sweat. It's like, I don't know why I'm sweating. It's like, well, actually, the music's making you nervous. Exactly. I mean, think of how many, like, sometimes you'll see a movie where there is some horrible thing going on, 
but the music's like up and, and so you're kind of like, oh, it's Reservoir awesome. Dogs. Right? Meanwhile, yeah. someone's yes. like, stuck in the middle of the uni, he's cutting the guy's ear off, and it's like, oh, what a great song. I love this song. The best, like, you the, know, maimed the best, man. One of the best examples for that is what they do with like animal documentaries. Like when you see seals, it's like up light music and then a great white, and it's like, yeah, and it's yeah. like, like a murderer is coming in. It, it either subliminally or overtly does exactly what you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you watched any of these episodes, and I'll just speak for Are You Afraid of the Dark, I, I don't want to say they desperately needed the music, but they desperately needed the music. And it's, it's not casting aspersions on the script or the acting or the directing or the editing. All that stuff needs to be there. But the music is more than just the cherry on top of the cake. It is the thing that pulls it all together. There, there are episodes, and I won't mention any of them, that were not very good until you put the music in it. And that helps to tell the story. It tells you how you should be feeling. If something may not necessarily have been on screen, the music will tell you something scary is happening, even though nothing's scary or whatever happens to be. So yeah, so the music was huge. And those two guys, and I would, those two guys had very distinct styles. Talk about right what comes out. In my opinion, they had two different styles. Jeff was much more theme-based and, and hooks and upbeat stuff. So he wrote the Sardo episodes and he wrote the action adventure episodes and the funny stuff. And Ramon was more heartfelt stuff. So we were all the romantic and the, and the, uh, and the heartfelt episodes. And that's, that's where their wheelhouse was in each one. And so I assigned the, cool. the shows accordingly. And if not that you're going to be checking it, but if you watch an episode, look at who the composer was and then listen to music. I will now. That's, we will. They were just incredibly talented guys. So yeah. Uh, how, how excited were like I know I remember in the I'm Cold episode you guys grabbed Melissa Joan Hart from Clarissa to do like did you guys try to do that with the Nickelodeon family or did they like volunteer like she saw this show on and was like oh my god I want to be on an episode or did you guys saw you guys filming you know like you know that work it it was it was more it wasn't Nickelodeon generated thing and it wasn't necessarily let's get our people in your shows uh, in your show it was more when you're promoting a show, anything, especially when you're into episode seven of a season, you need to have something that's promotable. That's what they call promotable. So if you have a guest star that has some notoriety, that right. gives them justification to put a commercial on about it. So um, what's an example? Bobcat Goldthwaite was in The Final Wish. You know, he's a comedian. He was really popular back then. He's in the Police Academy movies. So they promoted it because he was in it. Um, so yeah, so the fact that Melissa was was in the episode that made them promote the, the episode a little bit more. So that, right, that was like, oh, Clarissa's going to be in this episode. Come watch Clarissa be in Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and I, like, I didn't go to them to say, hey, who you got that we can use? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me, that's uh, cool though, because they you had the Maori sisters in one too. Tia and Tamara were in one. Yeah. I believe with the lizard, like one turned into a lizard or something like that. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. I just have to say, before we get in our final segment, my favorite episode was the dollhouse one where the girl was turning into the doll and had to get out. I love that. Yeah, one. That, that was cool. I like yeah, that one. That was one of my favorite. But there's so many, man. I mean, the one where the kid was take, had mirrors in his house and taking the life from his guests. I, I could go on for hours. Like, I just have to say, you, you know, you helped, like, raise us, us parked in front of the TV, you and your creator so it's really not cool me you except <laughs> ellie she ran out of room crying you know what one scared me the one where the guys went in the shipwreck and grabbed all the gold out and then the fucking just all of them people were dead them. coming from the ocean for their gold back but that, that's one of my favorite episodes that's a I, great I, one but, but again it's like being the, being the creator of the show I look at it i have a lament about that episode is that it was about two minutes too short uh, but i had to cut it down to time because it things happen too fast I, it wasn't allowed to because, you know, shows are yeah, you get like 20 minutes, right? Because of commercials it, and whatnot. Yeah. Well, a typical 30 minute show is about 22 minutes long. So, but then take away a minute and a half for the Midnight Society, take away 30 seconds for uh, credits front and back. Suddenly you're under 20 minutes for a show. So you have to establish characters, establish uh, conflict, have a twit. You know, it's like, whoo, it's talking about short stories. So that was a one. Well, I- it was one of my favorite episodes, but it's just like, oh, if only it was two minutes longer, I could have just spread it out a little yeah. bit. I, I'm sorry, too. I, we never touched on the reboot in 2019. I did watch. I, I liked it. The three-episode series. I, I think it was really cool. Um, did, were you, you were involved in that? Were you hands-on? No, you weren't. Nothing. 
It's, okay. it's, a whole, it's a whole story into itself. But there were two seasons of that. Yeah, there's, I haven't caught up with the second one yet. I know there's another I, season. Nor have I. <laughs> I saw <it> <laughs> These are terrible. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought the, the first one uh, was really well executed. Mm, I, I didn't mind it. It brought me back to my childhood. It was like I watched it. No matter how old I was, I'm going to watch that. You yeah. Know? yeah, but if the OG's not doing it, it's kind of like, Wait. I know. It's like season five in Live, of In Living Color. You're just like, all right. Well, well I did warn the producers. <laughs> that you realize that you can't be making this show for the people who watch Starry Friday of the Dark because yeah. you're making it for kids who are 10 years old today. Yeah. And they got that. They, they understood that. So yeah. you can't take the criticism of, well, it's not the same as the old. Drug. No, no, no. No, I mean, not at all. But I mean... As us, how could we not compare it? Even not, you know, yeah. knowing, even knowing that it's like, there's no way to not even subconsciously like compare knowing it's its own separate thing, but it's just the rebrand, but it's still just like, mm, no, no yeah. DJ didn't do it. So I don't really want to, I don't really care. Well, just, <laughs> it, it was an anthology right there. It didn't, you know, right. stop right there. It's, it, if it's not an anthology, it's not Are You Afraid of the Dark. And but, you had to like go into it knowing, all right, this is what it's going to be. This is what it is. So yeah, I, I didn't cool. enjoy it. I didn't do it. Yeah, I thought it was really well. Executed. I didn't see the second one, but but the first one I thought was really well executed. And and frankly, the reason why Ned and I are our, our names all over it, it, it's a birthright. I mean, we created yeah. the show, so right. that's that's why. We're there. All right, uh, DJ, we do a final segment here. Uh, it's called Gun to Your Head. It's not as violent as it sounds. I swear to God. And um, it's kind of like a Would You Rather. And we ask one or two questions each, and you have to pick your favorite question. They're kind of quirky questions. A little wordplay involved. So um, I'll start first, okay? Because I've been yeah, in a. Slump. There would be no math to this. No, no math. I, I've been in a slump here, so I, I need to pick up, and I'm not confident about this. Okay. Would you rather be a great writer who who types slow, or a great typer who writes slow? Ugh. You want to be a good talker? <laughs> Great talk. <laughs> well, um, uh, what was the second option? Okay, a great writer who types <laughs> slow or a great typer that writes slow? Um, Talk about a horror film. <laughs> I, I'm a, I am a, I, w I would never characterize myself as a great writer, but, um, but I am a decent writer who reads slow. Okay. I wish that I could read faster than I do. Um, but I type like the wind. Okay. So, uh, one of the best pieces of advice is I ever best pieces of advice, best piece of advice I ever got. It was it was my last year of junior high. I was in ninth grade, and and about to go into high school. And I asked this one of the cool teachers. I said, "You have any advice for high school? What should I do? What classes I should take? You take anything else? Take a half year class on personal typing." <laughs> you will not regret it and he was absolutely right yeah i, I mean am, it's the I future like the yeah not so. me i had mavis beacon teach mavis bacon me. that bitch yeah. can teach me anything well, sorry that's for you because i can type without looking <laughs> you and my husband both my husband like i'm like are you stupid like what yeah are you ellie <laughs> why don't you take on the question you got one all right i do right. so would you rather be a fish or always have to carry a fish with you well, I, I'd rather be a fish because then there's no restrictions. Fair. As long fair, as there was fair. no added uh, thing I had to do, which apparently not. You have ick. I don't know if you're an intelligent that. response. <laughs> yeah, like very good response. <laughs> I'd rather be a fish. All right, we'll go to Eric, who definitely has some wordplay involved with Are You Afraid of the Dark? But we'll No, it has nothing to do with Are You Afraid of the Dark? No. Would you rather get caught in the episode Tale of the Whispering Wall? Or whisper every time you're near a wall. <laughs> so, am I going to be in danger or crazy? I guess yeah. That's what I'm so, um, uh, I think I'd rather be in danger because then I have a shot at getting out of it. There you go. Okay. You said it had answer. nothing to do with the for dark, but you mentioned an episode, Brian. That's why I'm hilarious. Yep. Uh, all right. Would you rather be on Naked and Afraid or be afraid of being naked? <laughs> um, I, I would rather be on Naked and Afraid. And one of the reasons I can say that is because a friend of mine produces that show and he makes that show. Wow. And it's, uh, it's not a picnic, believe me, for those contestants, but it's also yeah. not as horrible as you think it might be. <laughs> If so, you need uh, any contestants, DJ, I am quite the survivalist, I have to say. Oh, I, you don't well, leave your basement. 
I survived. That's why I stay down here. I, I didn't say how I survived. I said I'm quite the survivalist because I don't go outside. This is great. <laughs> All right. Um, last one from me. So would you rather for one day be friends with Art Carney or for the rest of your life be a Carney who's really good at art? <laughs> Solid laugh. Well, I, ooh, being a Carney, that's mm -hmm. suspect. But you're good at art. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, well. well uh, Tough question. I'll Good question. I'm dead. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd uh, rather, I, I'd like to meet Art Carney. Me too. But uh, probably one of the best talents of all time in television, honestly. Um, but we'll, we'll leave that great question. Go on, Ellie. You have another one or no? <laughs> we'll leave that. Come back to me. All right, Eric? Uh, would you rather teach film at a college or teach people how to collage? <laughs> Got it. I, I have taught film at a college so i know what that's like and it wasn't fun so yeah. uh uh and on an artistic level for that uh i could never live up to scott's uh oh uh, i was amazing you know i had to do a collage for iago and othello and instead of a board i cut out a black heart because he was evil and i put the pictures on wow get out that's clever <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I'll teach collage. Because you can also get away, you can get away with a lot of stuff with collage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Good. Great answer. Great question. Let's go. And, I, and I could always help out if you need to, Brian. Would you rather have a duck bill or travel with a duck named Bill? <laughs> Bill the Bone Crusher. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Bill Bone Saw or whatever. Bill bone <laughs> Um, that's what it was. I I, uh, I kind of like the idea of traveling with a duck. That's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, I, I, when I was a kid, my sister had a pet duck named Peter, uh, and that duck was awesome. And she used to take it everywhere with her. So uh, I I kind of know what that's like. So yeah. Hey, we have people here who had animals. One of them actually, you know, happened to murder a turtle by accident, but we won't say who. Ellie, do you have a? Do you have one? It's not murder yes, by accident. Okay. So. Given the opportunity, limitless budget, full creative license, do whatever you want, would you rather write and produce a movie and direct yes, about the Chupacabra or the Loch Ness Monster? I wish I knew what the Chupacabra was. Okay, wow. How do you write Are You Afraid of the Dark and you don't know the Chupacabra? Like, I'm, come what's, on now. What's, what's the Chupacabra? So it translates to goat sucker, and it's this. It's I don't know what that is either. Quiet, you. It's um <laughs> this thing goat that like sucker? sucks all the blood out of like goats and cows. It's a. It looks Mexican, like a small like Mexican dog. folklore. Quiet, you. I was gonna say it sounds folklore. kind of Mexican. Yeah. Um, so so given that, um, and given the fact that I am not familiar with that, I have to make the the next assumption that most people are not familiar with that, or not true. There hasn't been a lot of media done on the Chupacabra, so therefore I'd rather do the Chupacabra because Loch Ness has been done. Excellent, Excellent choice. Thank you. Answer. I would have taken the easy road out because that's just who I am. Because you're lazy. Exactly. I admit it. <laughs> I can't, I can't yeah. even iron a shirt. <laughs> so, so, all right, DJ, your favorite question. You got to pick a winner. Oh. Uh, I'll go for the... Uh, I, uh, oh, we're trying to remember what it was. Um, I, I, I like the uh, teaching film or, or collage. <laughs> yeah. I'm so upset because I really thought my art carnival yeah. was going to put it over the What air. a great response. Oh, that's so episode. annoying. Oh, my uh, God. Should we do a shaming or no? Like, cause we yeah. usually, okay. All right. So we also like to shame people on this show. Cause we're not above that. And I need no. you to pick, he's like, he's like, of course. I need you to pick your, the, your least favorite question. Um, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> we're all adults. We're, not nice. we're all yeah. adults. It's it more of an improvement. Who needs to improve the best? Right. Well, even though it was a clever play on words, I guess the uh, the duck question. Very bad question. You know, you gotta yeah. you gotta improve. I had right? so much I had so much trouble reading through that. I couldn't get the words out, you know. This is real I, tough. 
DJ, this is really cool. Like, honestly, more more than, uh, like, I even ever thought it would be talking to you guys, talking to you. Uh, this is, like, our third Nickelodeon episode. So really appreciate it, man. And um, if, if you want to send over your uh, high school video through a message <laughs> and we can watch it, we'd, we'd be love. We'll, we'll never post it and we'd be happy to watch it. Or we can do a watch party at your house if you feel so inclined yeah, to say. Uh, it's, pain, <laughs> it's painful to watch stuff it's like, that's been a long time. It's painful for me for, to watch some of the Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes. I'm like, yo. Well, we could listen to our old too, songs scary. we made when we were 15, and then you could show us your old video you made when you were 15. They're <laughs> equally as horrible. Definitely. No, but really, thank you very much. This is really cool, and I hope you had fun. I hope you had a great time, man. Yes, I did. Thank you very much, guys. That was thank a lot you. of fun.